bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba. We would also like to thank the following Keystone partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. We've had a, a bit of a hiatus over the last while. The month of October is always our conference month, so it's always tough to fit things in around that big event. Uh, so first, I'd like to thank everyone who, who was able to join us uh, at the CAFC Annual Conference in Calgary this year. It was an excellent conference, and, uh, and a huge thank you to our hosts from the Alberta Children's Hospital, who really put on a great show at the, for those of you who were at the Calgary Zoo and the line dancing and everything else that we saw out there. It was fantastic. So we heard lots of good feedback. We had our delegate survey and lots of positive feedback from uh, from all of our delegates. So thanks again to, all, to our hosts and to all of the delegates that really made that a great event. We will be posting copies of uh, presentations and other information from the conference on our conference site at conference.capsi.org shortly. We don't have them all yet from our presenters, but that stuff will be up, up very shortly. Uh, my name is Doug Maynard. I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And uh, today's webinar is titled, What Can We Learn About Children's Health Through Data Linkage? Oh, uh, let's get on to the presentation. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Marnie Brownell, who is a uh, Senior Research Scientist with the Manitoba Centre for uh, Health Policy. Uh, she's also an associate professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences at the College of Medicine and the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. She has a PhD in developmental psychology and for the last several years has worked in the area of population and public health research. Um, Dr. Brownell also, she uses administrative health and social service databases, survey and registry data, as well as clinical data sets to examine child health and well-being with a particular focus on social determinants of health. So it's really my pleasure to bring uh, Dr. Uh, Brownell to this uh, to this uh, session. We're really looking forward to, uh, to this presentation. So over to you, uh, Dr. Brownell. Thanks very much, Doug. So you can see my screen and you can hear me? Yes, we can. You're a little bit quiet. Perfect. Oh, no, that, oh, okay. sounds, that, that sounds better now. There we go. Okay, good. <laughs> Just closer to the microphone. Uh, so thanks very much for that introduction and, and for providing me with this opportunity to be here uh, and talk about uh, what we can learn about children's health through data linkage, uh, kind of a dry sounding topic. But uh, let me just uh, go over what I'm going to uh, talk about today uh, and then I'll get right into it. So I want to define data linkage for you, for those of you who don't know what it is. Um, and I'm going to kind of cheat at that, but uh, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, I'm also going to describe the, the data repository that we have at the Manitoba Centre for Health Policy, or MCHP. And then I'm going to describe a program of research that we're currently involved in uh, that's using this repository to study children's health. Um, and so that's uh, basically the three things I'm going to cover today. When I said I was going to cheat in describing data linkage, I'm actually going to show you a video and, and Doug and, and his side are going to take care of this. And just as a little background to this, I was part of a symposium in September uh, that involved uh, researchers from five different countries and we were all talking about using administrative data to study uh, issues in child welfare. And um, one of the researchers from the University of Southern California, her name is Emily Putnam Hornstein, explained that you know when she's talking to, to other researchers or policymakers or whoever it is, she said in her work she has to describe data linkage. And she said whenever she did a presentation, when she got to the point where she was describing data linkage, everybody's eyes would glaze over. <laughs> and so she she realized she had to find a way uh, that would convey this information that people would uh, understand and pay attention to. So she showed this video and I think it actually is fantastic in describing uh, what it is data linkage is. Uh, so I will, without further ado, let's see um, if we can uh, run this video. Children's experiences and environments between birth and age five are foundational to later good health, educational attainment, and overall well-being. At the Children's Data Network, we believe that by making better and smarter use of available data, we can ensure that more children grow up with the foundations needed for success. Throughout the life course, individuals generate data in the form of various records and documentation. When a child is born, health and demographic information is recorded. 
If that child is later referred for a developmental evaluation or receives early intervention services, other records are created. These records, called administrative data, are collected through distinct systems under the authority of different public agencies. The siloed nature of administrative data has long posed problems for policymakers, managers, and researchers. Information from a single agency provides a very partial picture of children's trajectories through systems over time. It cannot be used to determine the number of children concurrently served by two or more agencies. And it limits the identification of antecedent events captured in one data system that predict later outcomes observed in another. It is through a process called record linkage that information for the same individual can be integrated and used for research and evaluation. After records have been securely linked and anonymized to protect confidentiality, these data can be aggregated to generate rich epidemiologic information and answer important questions. Are nutritional supports during the first five years of life tied to later educational performance? Do children in foster care have unique health and mental health service trajectories? Does the receipt of early home visiting services lower a child's risk of abuse or neglect? Developing high quality evidence for program and policy effectiveness is a strategy worth investing in for the long term. By making use of administrative records, the children's data network can help us understand what makes our children, our families, and our communities healthier, safer, stronger. There we go. So now I should be back to my screen. Um, and that, that gives you sort of the specifics of, of uh, data uh, record linkage uh, for kids. And I'm going to tell you now about uh, uh, data record linkage at uh, the Manitoba Center for Health Policy, where we really have been a pioneer in this. Um, the Manitoba Center for Health Policy has been around for over 20 years, but the work using record linkage uh, goes back to the early 70s, so over 40 years. Um, so as I say, we really are a pioneer in this area. Uh, so a bit about MCHP, uh, we're part of the University of Manitoba, we're a research uh, center within the university, and it's our mandate uh, to provide accurate and timely information to decision makers, clinicians, uh, analysts, data uh, uh, and service providers. Um, and it, this is all to, to uh, provide evidence-based information so that evidence-based decisions can be made uh, when trying to uh, improve the health of Manitobans. Uh, this, this slide shows uh, some examples of some of the key databases in the MCHP repository, which we call the Population Health Research Data Repository. And I say key databases because in our repository, we have over 70 different uh, data databases. Um, most of them at the population level uh, and linkable at the person level. Uh, and they, they span several sectors. So of course there's the health data like hospital, uh, pharmaceuticals, physician visits, but also lots of social information as well. Uh, and in the middle I just wanted to uh, spend a moment talking about this population-based health registry, which is really very important for the work we do. This is uh, a copy of the health registry that Manitoba, ha Manitoba Health, which is the Department of Health in Manitoba, has uh, that shows everybody who's registered for healthcare in the province. So it's virtually everyone in the province. And it provides us with a census of, of the province of Manitoba. So you can see how important that is uh, in the kind of work we do. If we just had, say, hospital data and we wanted to, to study hospitalizations, we'd know who was being hospitalized, but we wouldn't know who wasn't being hospitalized. So this population-based health registry really provides us with a denominator uh, for the work we do. Um, it's important uh, to note that this is anonymized data or these are anonymized data. And I just want to spend a, a minute talking about how that's done. Um, this is very simplified, uh, but it gives you an idea of how we can be working with these data without having identifying information like names and addresses, 
but allowing us to link the data across sectors and over time. So here uh, is an example of a, a database that's uh, from a non-health department. Let's just say it's the Department of Education. And they want to deposit a copy of their data in uh, the MCHP repository so that we can do work connecting the education with the health data. So what uh, this data set is made up of is really three parts. There's identifying information with names and addresses. Uh, there's an internal reference number, which is scrambled. Um, it's a scrambled person or, or case number. And then there's uh, the program data. So for example, for education, this might be Mary Smith. Uh, her Manitoba education number might be 10, but they've scrambled it and made it some other number. So uh, it's not recognizable, but they know how they've scrambled it. And then the program information could be things like uh, the grade she's enrolled in, some of her assessment information, um, and uh, the school she goes to. So th that would be the program information. And all that they want to send to MC to be linkable. So what happens is we use what's called third-party linkage. And the third party uh, is Manitoba Health, the Department of uh, Health. So what happens is education would send the identifying information to Manitoba Health, but none of the program information. Uh, so it's still, there's nothing Manitoba Health can learn about Mary Smith other than her name. Um, to, Matt, to MCHP, the Department of Education sends the program information and their internal reference number. Then what Manitoba Health does with those names and addresses is they look through their records and find the personal health information number. They strip off that identifying information, the names and addresses, and they encrypt or anonymize the personal health information number. So they have an algorithm to do that, and they do it the same way for all databases. So now there's an anonymized FIN and an anonymized education number, and this is known as a crosswalk file. And they send it over to MCHP where we have the program data and the, that uh, internal reference number linked together. And now we can put the program information with the scrambled FIN. And all our data sets have a scrambled FIN. And so that's how we can link across um, sectors and, and over time for the same individual. So quite simplified, but it gives you an idea of how this uh, process can be done. So I just want to talk a bit about uh, some of the key data sets that are used to study child health and development um, at MCHP uh, to give you a sense of how, how powerful this research resource is. Uh, and if you think about uh, child development along a timeline from prenatal through adolescence, we have data sets at each of these stages and across uh, all stages. Uh, so at the prenatal period, even before the child's born, there's lots of rich information. There's information about maternal health behaviors that comes from something called the family's first screen. Uh, so what this is, in Manitoba for many, many years, Public health nurses have been visiting uh, moms with newborns, uh, as I say, for many years, at least over 20 years, because my eldest is 20 and, and we had a visit from the public health nurse uh, when she was born. And at that visit, the public health nurse fills out this family first screen. Uh, and you know they don't do it obviously. They don't sit there sort of checking things off. But in the course of the conversation, which is all uh, focused around the mom's health and the baby's health, taking care of baby, the public health nurse explores a bunch of items that are on this family first screen. And the, the purpose of the screen is to identify families uh, that are facing challenges. Now, it, for prenatal information, moms are asked about whether they smoked during pregnancy, whether they drank during pregnancy, whether they used any medications or, or uh, drugs during pregnancy. So lots of rich information. And that we have available on about 85% of the population. It's supposed to be universal, but sometimes uh, families are missed in this screen. Um, from the physician visit data, we can tell when a mom initiated prenatal care and how often she saw the doctor. And then there's also laboratory data, including the maternal serum screen. Uh, then at birth, lots of rich information, a lot of it coming from the, the hospital record. Uh, we have birth weight, gestational age, APGAR scores, whether or not breastfeeding was initiated, whether there were complications uh, during labor or delivery, and more information from the family's first screen. Uh, is this a single mom? Uh, is she socially isolated? Does she have any mental disorders? Uh, again, lots of rich information. And so mom and babe uh, can be linked together uh, to, to get more information. Uh, 
across all the stages once a child is born, uh, we can look at health status by using a combination of hospitalizations, doctor visits and medications prescribed. All of those are recorded in the databases. Uh, we have an immunization monitoring network which records all immunizations given in the province. From that health registry I was talking about, um, we can get residence information so we can link to area level census information for socioeconomic uh, indicators like income, education, employment. As well, uh, you can look and see that that registry is updated every six months. So over the course of uh, a childhood, you could look and see, for example, how often a child moved, which may affect their development. Also from that health registry, we can look at family composition, things like marital status, birth order and number of siblings. And there's lots of social service information, things like income assistance and involved, involvement with child welfare, as well as clinical data sets uh, within the repository. And here I just have the example of the, uh, uh, there's a data set from the Manitoba FASD Center of Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder, uh, where they've been uh, collecting data on all the assessments they've done since 1999. Uh, and a copy of that is deposited uh, regularly into uh, the MCHP repository. So besides all this information, there's additional information in the early years on child care, uh, whether or not a child is uh, in a subsidized space. And then at school entry, we start with all the education data. Uh, there's a, a data set uh, known as the Early Development Instrument. Uh, some of you on the, on the line may be familiar with this. This is a, a, a population-based measure of children's uh, developmental health at the, this important time when they're transitioning into school. And it measures uh, developmental health along five domains, uh, physical health, social development, emotional health, uh, cognitive and language development, and then general knowledge and communication skills. Uh, it's done in kindergarten, uh, and in Manitoba it's done province-wide every two years. So lots of rich information coming from that, and really measuring what's happened before kids have come to school. Uh, as well, once kids enter school, there's enrollment information for all grades, and uh, we know which kids are receiving funding for special needs. And uh, those are all categorized. So you can see if a child is receiving special funding for an emotional behavior disorder, for an autism spectrum disorder, all sorts of categories for that. Then in grade three, there are assessments province-wide uh, in reading and numeracy, uh, as well as that enrollment and uh, special needs information. And then in grade seven and eight, there's more assessments. In grade seven, they assess uh, kids' math uh, and, and also student engagement, which is a really important predictor of how kids are going to do in high school, whether they're engaged in school in grade seven. And in grade eight, there's a reading and writing assessment. And then in high school, um, we have some standards tests uh, which are, are required uh, for all students in grade 12 in language arts and mathematics. And uh, grade, uh, high school is uh, grades 9 to 12 in Manitoba. And for all grade 9 to 12 students, we have all of the course marks for all of the courses they take. So you know, if you're interested in looking at trajectories uh, across high school, there's information uh, on that as well. We can determine uh, whether uh, kids have completed high school. So you can see this is a really rich resource uh, for conducting uh, uh, research. Uh, and conducting some very exciting research. Uh, in fact, uh, several years ago, we went uh, uh, to the Child Institute in Minnesota. I can't remember the, the name of the institute, very famous institute. And one of the psychologists there referred to our repository as a gold mine. Um, so I, I pulled up this comic uh, because sometimes we really do see ourselves as miners uh, who could get lost uh, for years in, in the data we have. And this, uh, if, if, if it's not very clear, the mom is uh, saying to her son, promise me, Alex, that you'll find work in the fields or factories and won't follow your father into the data mines. Um, so it is important um, to have specific research goals and, and directions. Um, and this is what uh, this cartoon is illustrating. Uh, clearly, somebody punched into a GPS, take, a, take me to the most exciting destination of my life. Um, and uh, you have to be careful what you you ask for, and, and uh, this just shows you do need to be specific. Uh, and this leads us into the uh, paths uh, 
uh, Equity for Children Program of Research. PATH stands for Pathways to Health and Social Equity. And this is a program of research we're about, we're just over halfway through this five-year grant uh, that's funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research uh, as well as the Heart and Stroke Foundation. And in it, we're evaluating uh, the impact of a number of programs that have been operating in Manitoba. And I'm going to get into some specifics uh, quite soon. Uh, so the PASS Equity for Children, um, we've got a, a large research team led by uh, Patricia Martin. Pat Martins, many of you will know her. Uh, we have a, a lead principal investigator group uh, that meets monthly to keep up because there's several sub-projects ongoing. And this uh, program of research actually involves all of the scientific, scientists at the Manitoba Centre for Health Policy, as well as colleagues outside uh, the centre at the University of Manitoba and the University of Winnipeg, as well as colleagues across uh, the country and some colleagues in the US. So um, a lot of research scientists and students involved in this. As well, we have a lot of policymakers involved um, we have an advisory board that uh, meets uh, twice a year, and uh, on the advisory board we have uh, six uh, deputy ministers, uh, uh, government deputy ministers from Manitoba, as well as the Healthy Child Committee of Cabinet. Um, and those of you who aren't familiar, um, Manitoba has this um, perhaps not so much uh, unique anymore, but when it started it was unique, uh, what's known as the Healthy Child Manitoba Office. And rather than being a single government department, Healthy Child Manitoba spans all the government departments that touch on the lives of children. So currently that involves 10 different ministries. And this Healthy Child Committee of Cabinet is the ministers from all of those 10 ministries who get together regularly to talk about how to improve uh, health and well-being for, for Manitoba's kids. Um, and we have representation from that committee as well as uh, six deputy ministers uh, from within the deputy ministers version of the Healthy Child Committee of Cabinet are on our, on our advisory board. Uh, we also have clinicians. Uh, we have uh, representatives from the regional health authorities in Manitoba and the United Way. And we're using in this, uh, in this program of research what's known as an integrated KT approach. So rather than us doing research as scientists and then going to the policymakers when we have results and saying, hey, what do you think? Um, the policymakers and the program developers and program managers uh, have been involved right from the get-go. In fact, before we even submitted this grant, we had a large meeting, uh, policymakers, program providers, clinicians, all sorts of people. We got together for a day-long session hashing out ideas about what we could do with our repository data to, to evaluate programs in Manitoba. What would be important uh, from policymakers' point of view for us to look at uh, and what was feasible with the, with the repository of data. Um, and we, we continue to involve policymakers not only with our advisory board but each of the sub-projects which I'm going to tell you about in a minute um, has its own little team team of investigators, which involves scientists, uh, it involves uh, program managers, uh, and policy makers. So we really um, are using, as I say, this integrated KT approach. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and, and this comic, uh, uh, this, wom this woman is saying to her colleague, we like to bring together people from radically different fields and wait for the friction to produce heat, light, and magic. Sometimes it takes a while, and that is really so true. We have been uh, building and maintaining relationships uh, with policymakers, program developers, uh, program managers for many, many years at MCHP. Uh, those of you who do this kind of work know it takes a lot of work, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I'll tell you, we are getting heat, light, and magic from the Paz Equity for, for Children program, though. It, it, it's really working for us. Um, so just let me run through the specific objectives of, uh, of the program so you understand what it's all about. Um, we're evaluating a dozen interventions um, that are operating or were operating in Manitoba focused on improving things for kids. And for each of these, we're looking not only whether um, uh, kids' outcomes improved, their health and well-being, but also what the program did in terms of reducing uh, inequities or gaps. 
Um, we know often a program can work, but the gap between, say, the rich and the poor actually increases even though the program is working to improve overall outcomes. So we were really interested in measuring that gap. Um, and I think this really epitomizes, uh, for those of you who are wondering about the differences between e equality and equity, um, I love this, uh, this uh, visual that I think I first saw uh, someone from CIH, uh, CIHI uh, present. So this shows equality. Everybody's getting the same thing, but you can see it hasn't leveled the playing field for these kids. Um, you need a little boost for this for this kid in order to have a level playing field, and that's what we mean by equity, um, uh, having that level playing field for all. Uh, so the second objective was to enhance uh, population-based methodologies on measuring equity using administrative data. And this has been harder than, than it looks. Um, uh, there's not really a large literature on the measurement of equity and even a smaller literature on measuring changes in equity. Uh, and so uh, we've worked really hard and we've got some really smart methodologists, I'm not one of them, um, uh, working on this in the PAS equity uh, uh, project. Um, for, or the third objective was to look at the potential benefits of integration of programs. So in this, you know, because we're looking at uh, 12 uh, interventions that have been operating in Manitoba, some of them at the population level, we have kids who have been in more than one of these interventions. So we're going to be able to see whether there's synergies across programs uh, for these kids. Uh, and then finally, there's a qualitative component for this program of research where for one, two or three uh, specific projects, we're drilling down and um, exploring whether whether there's organizational barriers or facilitators to reducing inequity for children. So in a nutshell, for each of the sub-projects, we're asking uh, who gets who gets the intervention. Um, so if it's targeted, we say, is it reaching its target audience? But if it's universal, we're saying, hey, is everybody getting this? Um, is it really a truly universal program? And we're able to do that with our health registry. Uh, we're also asking whether uh, the program in, uh, improved health and well-being, whether it shrunk that, uh, that gap and whether there are multiplicative or additive effects that synergy across programs. And this is a list of the, the 12 programs that we're evaluating. I'll just run through them quickly. The Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, which many of you will be familiar with. Uh, um, this is a, a program across the country and, and uh, internationally, actually. The Physician Integrated Network. There's an early intervention program for uh, kids with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, an early intervention and prevention program for psychosis, uh, in-school uh, teen clinics, these are reproductive health clinics, uh, something called the Healthy Baby Program, which I'm going to be talking about uh, in a minute to provide you with an example. Uh, same with the Family First Home Visiting uh, Program. I'll go into a little more detail as well, well as the social housing. Uh, there's a program called the Community School Investigator Summer Learning Enrichment, uh, which is targeted to low-income schools. Uh, it started out in Winnipeg, but it's expanded. The Healthy, Buddy Program, Healthy Buddies Program, uh, some of you may have heard about this, particularly those of you in BC. Uh, it's a program uh, that is uh, trying to reduce uh, overweight uh, in, in kids and also increase uh, active living. Uh, Roots of Empathy, which I think many of you will be familiar with, and also Full Day Kindergarten. So th those are the programs, the specific programs we're evaluating. And then as I said, we're doing that qualitative analysis. Uh, we're doing that integrative analysis, and we've also just begun uh, looking at something called public health sensitive conditions. This is we're trying to develop a measure that's akin to the ambulatory care sensitive conditions that some of you may be familiar with, um, and uh, so that's uh, just at the beginning stages now. So this just shows you a timeline of the projects. Um, almost all of them are underway, uh, and some of them are actually complete. I wanted to talk uh, just a bit about the, uh, what we call the PAVS data resource um, because very early on, uh, what happens when we, we do research at MCHP is for each separate project, we basically build a data resource. So if you were looking at hospitalizations and medications for, say, kids with ADHD, you'd 
select your cohort, you would pull that data and then run your project and then um, you know, no longer use that data. For PATHS, we decided since there was so much overlap in these programs, that we would build a comprehensive data resource that would be available for all of the programs in the study. And that way, we would have consistent definitions, not only of outcomes, uh, but of all the covariates that we're using. Of course, we're using the repository for this. And this PATHS resource already is being used um, not only by MCHP researchers, uh, researchers for research beyond the PATHS uh, program of research, but researchers outside MCHP uh, who are looking looking at uh, any research to do with kids. So it's proved a very valuable resource already. Uh, who's included in this? Uh, we've chosen every child, uh, zero, which we've defined as 0 to 18, uh, who lived in Manitoba at some point between uh, 1984 and 2014. Uh, so you can see it spans a lot of years. I think that's uh, 31 years. And so we will have uh, kids, quote unquote, who were 18 in 1984 who are now uh, in their 40s uh, in 2014. So um, it's not just the 0 to 18 year olds, but uh, people who were 0 to 18 during this, this time span. Uh, children don't have to be present for the entire time period or even born in Manitoba to be included in the resource. And with our health registry, we're able to then identify the kids who um, you know, have been here the whole time, born in Manitoba, here their whole lives, or um, say moved in at five years of age, or say moved out of the province at seven years of age. Um, so in the resource, we have almost 600,000 individuals. Um, we're, in, we're increasing metadata or information about the data um, as part of the PATHS uh, resource. I'm just going to pause for a second. I had a call coming in, so your, my voice would blank out. Um, and uh, some of you may be familiar with the MCHP Concept Dictionary, which has been around for many, many years, uh, that provides information about the kind of work we do at MCHP. Uh, it defines variables. It has algorithms. And as, uh, it's available not only to internal researchers, but externally. Uh, and uh, as part of PATHS, we're building on this Concept Dictionary and adding all the information that we uh, uh, are, are learning from the, from the PATHS data. Um, researchers, this is a very iter iterative resource. Uh, so researchers can provide feedback and ask questions. And that helps to, to improve the resource. And of course, it facilitates information uh, flow between researchers, analysts, and uh, data management experts. Uh, the PATHS data resource uh, enables streamlining across multiple cohorts. Um, and so you know, if you want to look at, a, say, uh, a program that's been operating in Manitoba since 2000 and is focused on newborns, you can select birth cohorts from 2000 to 2014. Uh, so it, it, it makes it much easier to begin a project. Uh, and as I said, there's the consistency across projects. Also really important to, to stress is the inclusion of non-health related data, uh, which allows us to take that equity lens uh, to the findings, but also examine um, uh, social determinants of health um, as those antecedent uh, uh, events that were talked about in that video that, were shown, that was shown. Um, those of you who want more information about the, uh, the PATHS data resource, uh, we've recently published a paper in the International Journal of Epidemiology. Uh, it's available online now. Uh, if you go to our PATHS website, you can, you can connect to it. Um, or if that doesn't work, um, I welcome anyone to, to contact me if you would like a copy of this. It goes into great detail about the variables available, um, about how researchers from outside of of MCHP uh, can access this resource. Um, and I, you know, I don't expect you to copy that down. If you want to uh, get a copy of that, you can let me know afterwards. So getting back to the projects, I want to spend the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes um, that you'll hear me talking, uh, talking, uh, providing you with some examples of three of the, the sub-projects that we're, we're working on so you can get a flavor of the kind of work that we're doing and, and the kind of findings that we're, we're coming up with. So the first thing I want to talk about is social housing 
housing. Um, and here we were really interested in looking at whether the neighborhood socioeconomic status where social housing is located, whether that makes a difference uh, to kids' outcomes. So we were able to look at health and educational outcomes. Um, of course, you know, when we make a comparison between kids in social housing and those not in social housing, we would expect to see differences because we know social housing um, is reserved for those uh, who are living in poverty. Uh, but as I say, we were particularly interested in this study about the location of social housing. Just a little bit of background. Uh, uh, you probably all know social housing provides affordable housing uh, to families living in poverty. Um, there are about 30,000 people living in social housing that's managed by Manitoba Housing, and about half of those are uh, under the age of 20, so you can see there's a lot of kids in social housing. Um, Winnipeg, uh, in Winnipeg, the social housing isn't concentrated in just the core area, uh, in the poorer neighborhoods. It's scattered throughout uh, the city. And um, for this particular project, we divided Winnipeg into 72 community areas. Uh, we located the social housing within those community areas, and that's how we did the analysis. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. And of course, we used our, our repository. We used the PAS data resource. Um, so I'm going to walk you through, just start right in with the findings, but walk through slowly so you can see what's going on in this graph. First of all, we're looking at complete immunization uh, through our immunization monitoring system at two years of age. We're comparing those not in housing, and that's the orange bars, to those in social housing, the blue bars. Uh, you can see the years used here. And um, as I said, we used uh, the 72 community areas of Winnipeg. And what we did with those community areas is we aggregated them up into quintiles according to area level income. Um, so we have the individuals in social housing or not in social housing in the lowest income areas, and individuals uh, in in social housing and not social housing uh, in the highest and, and the three in between. And so the first thing uh, you'll notice is uh, that obvious thing that those in social housing uh, tend to have a lower immunization rate than those not in social housing in all of the income quintiles with the exception of the lowest uh, where it's it's a bit higher, but it wasn't statistically significant for those not in social housing. Perhaps no surprise there, because these would all be individuals with low income. And we know that there's a relationship between income and immunization. We generally see this gradient that you see if you just focus on the orange bars, um, at those not in social housing, that as you increase in area level income, or if you have measures of individual level income, you get an increase in immunization rate. So it goes from just over 60% uh, to about 73%. But if you look at the, the kids in social housing, you don't see that gradient. Uh, you can see that there really is no difference in immunization rate uh, depending on where the social housing is located. So even these kids in the highest income areas uh, in social housing are getting a, a about the same immunization rate as the kids in the lowest income areas. What happens when we look at the early development instrument? Remember, this is the, the measure of developmental health at kindergarten. The measure here is we're looking at kids who are not ready in one or, one or more of those five domains I told you about. Um, so the higher the percentage, it's really the poor outcome, because it's telling you there's more kids who aren't ready for, for school learning. Um, again, you see this gap between the kids in social housing and not in social housing when you compare the blue and orange bars within quintiles. When you look at those orange bars, you see what often we see um, uh, in, in when we look at the EDI across uh, area level income. As area level income increases, you get a decrease in the percent not ready. Or in you know the flip side of that is you get an increase in the percent of kids ready. Again, when we look across the blue, the kids in social housing, really not much of a difference. Uh, and no statistically significant differences um, uh, in the, the rate of kids who aren't ready for school learning. Uh, so it really doesn't matter where the social housing is. Now we're going to move to some uh, a couple of outcomes for teenagers, uh, and you can see how 
results change. Uh, this is high school completion. Uh, and again, just focus on the orange bars. You see what we generally look at when we look at the relationship between high school completion and income. As we increase in area level income, we get an increase in uh, kids completing high school. It goes from about 57% uh, to over 90% in the highest SES areas. Again, differences between those in social housing and not in social housing. But the big surprise, at least to us here, was that there is now a gradient for the kids in social housing. Those kids in social housing, although they're not doing as well as their peers um, who are not in social housing, the kids in social housing in the highest income areas are doing significantly better uh, in high school completion than those kids in the lowest areas, lowest income areas. About 27% uh, completion rate here, uh, and this is an over 60% uh, uh, completion rate. So for, in this case, where social housing is does matter. And we see the same thing for teen pregnancy. Um, there's a, a gradient for the kids not in social housing, uh, and here, of course, there's a decrease in teen pregnancy rates as we increase in area level income, and we also see that decrease for those in social housing. Uh, so in a nutshell, uh, what this uh, study has found is that where social housing is located matters, um, and as we saw, it doesn't seem to have an effect uh, for preschoolers. But once kid en kids enter school and, and the measures we had were, were kids in high school, um, the kids in social housing in the higher income areas have better outcomes than their counterparts in low income areas. This paper has recently been published in the American Journal of Public Health. Um, it too is available in an e-print um, or e-pub. It's not uh, printed yet, but again, uh, you, can, you can obtain it from our PATHS website or, or contact me if you want a copy of this. Um, uh, I want to talk next about the, the Healthy Baby Program as an example. Um, and this is a program that has been operating in Manitoba uh, since uh, the year 2000. And it's aimed at uh, promoting pre- and perinatal health. And it includes two separate components. Uh, there's a prenatal income supplement, which I'm going to be talking about more, and uh, community support programs. And as part of the PATHS uh, program of research, we're evaluating both of these. But today I'm just going to talk about the prenatal income supplement. Uh, so this is a, a benefit that starts in the second trimester of pregnancy. And the maximum amount, amount that can be uh, received by a woman during pregnancy is $81.41 a month. And to be eligible, a woman needs a medical note from her doctor confirming that she's pregnant. Uh, she needs to complete the application for the prenatal benefit, uh, which includes uh, um, uh, letting uh, uh, Canada Revenue, Revenue Agency provide information about uh, taxes uh, or family income. And the family income has to be less than $32,000. Um, and uh, of course, you have to be resident of Manitoba. So we were really interested in whether whether receiving that prenatal income supplement would have an impact or be associated with improved birth outcomes. And in order to do that, we compared low-income women receiving the benefit to those not receiving. And, and to, to get a comparable group of low-income women, we used all women on income assistance during pregnancy, uh, so they're getting a, a comparable uh, income, uh, all low income. They're all eligible for the benefit, but not all of them receive it. Now, of course, we were concerned about this right away because we said, well, those not receiving the the benefit, there might be differences uh, uh, in them besides um, their income. Uh, of course, the incomes are the same uh, to those who are receiving the benefit, but there might be some differences between those receiving the benefit and those not. So we've used propensity scoring uh, to ensure comparability of the groups. Uh, as I said, I'm not a methodologist. I'm not a statistician. So my, my explanation of this is going to be fairly simple. But it's a way of trying to make sure our groups are comparable on a number of measures. And we've looked at a whole number of measures for this propensity scoring. Many, of, all of them from the repository. Many of them come from that family first screen. And basically, what the propensity scoring does is um, makes our, our women more comparable. Our women in the uh, who received the benefit uh, to compare to those women who didn't receive the benefit. So what this uh, table shows is um, the standardized differences on each of these various before the waiting and then after the waiting shown in the, the blue squares. And you can see after waiting, 
our Winnipeg, our, our, our Winnipeg, our women are very comparable. What we were looking for, uh, the literature suggests, um, you know, standardized differences should be no more than 10%. And you can see even before weighting, on many of these variables, our women were, were comparable. But the women who didn't receive the benefit seem to be a little worse off. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, late initiation of prenatal care, the standardized differences between our group who received the benefit and the group who didn't receive the benefit were 20%. 20, 20 after waiting, um, there's virtually no difference between the groups. So it gives you an idea of what the propensity scores do. Um, and now I just want to briefly talk about the results. These are the, the outcomes we looked at. Things that are in bold are significant. Uh, we're looking at relative risks here. And anything uh, that crosses the bar is not significant, where the confidence intervals touch the bar. But they're significant if uh, the confidence intervals don't touch that middle line. And so you can see there was an increase in breastfeeding initiation associated with the prenatal benefit. You might be wondering why money during pregnancy would increase uh, breastfeeding initiation, but with the monthly check went information to, to all the mums about uh, healthy pregnancy and, and keeping your infant health healthy, so lots of information on breastfeeding. Uh, no difference on APGAR scores, but for low birth weight, preterm birth, and small for gestational age, they were all lower for the mums uh, who received the benefit. Large for gestational age was higher for mums who received the benefit, so a not so good outcome. Um, and complete immunization also higher for mums, uh, kids uh, of mums who received the benefit. And then hospital readmission, uh, no difference. Uh, one last uh, outcome to show you, average length of stay sort of as a global measure of health at birth, uh, significantly lower for those uh, uh, who received the healthy baby benefit compared to no benefit. So in a nutshell, again, uh, the receipt of the prenatal benefit during pregnancy was associated with mostly positive effects. I say mostly because there was that negative uh, outcome of uh, higher large for gestational age uh, births. Um, as, I, as I said at the beginning, um, we're not just looking at whether the um, uh, outcomes uh, were improved with the program, but whether or not that gap or those inequities were, were decreased. And to look at that, um, I've just brought the example of low birth weight births. Um, again, you know, some, some quite um, a sophisticated methodology, uh, but we've used propensity scores basically to develop two comparisons um, between high and low income. So measuring that gap for a group uh, where the low income received the healthy baby, and then measuring that gap between low and high income for a group uh, where the low income did not receive the healthy baby. Um, and these are the adjusted low birth weight rates uh, for those with that, this is low income without healthy baby, 5.5%, low income with healthy baby, 4.3%, and low, high income uh, who weren't eligible for healthy baby, almost 5%. And so when we look at the risk differences for that group uh, that received the healthy baby, when we do that comparison, um, the low income are actually better off. Uh, for the group who didn't receive the prenatal benefit, uh, the low income are worse off. So it does show a shrinking of the gap. Um, and now I'm just going to spend the, the last couple minutes uh, providing you with the example of the Family First Home Visiting Program. This is a home visiting program uh, that provides in, uh, information and support uh, to families with young children. It's operated through public health programs. And the whole focus of the program is to enhance uh, parents' nurturing and uh, supportive environment for their children. At any given time, there's about 1,500 families in the program. Um, there's weekly home visits uh, provided not by uh, public health nurses. Uh, some of you are familiar with the old uh, nurse practitioner model. This is based on the nurse practitioner model, although uh, rather than public health nurses, there are trained paraprofessionals who are trained by public health nurses. Home visiting is offered for three years, and you can see the average time uh, that a family is involved is a year and a half. And the curriculum focuses on positive parenting, child development, and family functioning. So in this uh, particular study, uh, and we've looked at more outcomes than this, but today I just wanted to focus on these three outcomes whether or not the home visiting was associated with fewer kids going into care of child and family services, fewer hospitalizations uh, for injuries related to child maltreatment, and whether um, child development scores on the early development instrument uh, would be 
better for kids um, who were involved in the in the home visiting. So that's sort of a long-term outcome, uh, measuring that at age five. Uh, in the methods, we've used several years of data. Uh, we chose only uh, kids in families who had very high risk scores. So besides that family first uh, screen that's initially done, there's a more in-depth screen for those families who screen at risk, and uh, that's based on the family stress checklist, the, the camp inventory that some of you are familiar with, um, and only families uh, that had high risk scores um, are involved um, in this analysis. Some of them are in the program and some did not receive home visiting. And so again, you know, we were concerned that the families not receiving home visiting may be different. Some of them didn't receive home visiting because they were on a wait list, but some didn't receive the home visiting program because they weren't interested in, in it. So um, we used, again, propensity scores to uh, try and make these group com groups comparable on as many variables as possible. So we used the same variables that were used in the um, uh, healthy baby, and I'm just going to show you some of the key ones uh, to show differences in families before this weighting was done, the propensity score weighting and after. Uh, so our families in the home visiting program had a higher risk score and lower area level income um, but the moms were slightly older uh, than those not in the home visiting. They had slightly lower alcohol or drug use during pregnancy, quite a bit lower smoking during pregnancy, quite a bit higher social isolation, and a uh, slightly lower a level of low education. So that would, you know, the flip side of that is uh, they have slightly higher education levels. After the waiting is done, you can see the families are uh, very, very comparable. Um, I think this is the only one that, uh, well, these are the only ones that differ by 0.1. Um, so what did we find? Uh, when we looked at children in care, we looked one year after birth, and we found that those in the Family First Home Visiting Program, uh, there was a lower predicted probability of being being taken into care than those not in the program. Two years after birth, the results remained. And so you can see the risk of being uh, taken into care was lower in both years for those who received home visiting. Uh, hospitalization for injury for maltreatment, lower for families uh, that participated uh, in the Family First Home Visiting Program compared to those who didn't participate. For the EDI, uh, we looked at not ready on one or more domain or two or more domains. One or more domain, you can see really no difference between those families uh, in the home visiting program compared to not. And same when we look at two or more domains. So, um, you know, sort of the conclusion here, we've been discussing our results uh, with policymakers and program managers. They're, of course, pleased with the results um, on the uh, maltreatment-related indicators, disappointed with the results uh, for the EDI, but there's always room for improvement, as, as Calvin is pointing out to his mother here. So before I wrap up, I just want to say there's a couple other articles, evaluations that we've published on. Uh, these publications are available on our website, our evaluation of the long-term benefits of full-day kindergarten, um, and one of the evaluations of the baby-friendly hospital initiative that's just been uh, published in the Canadian Journal of Public Health. Again, these are EPUBs ahead of uh, print versions. And I want to acknowledge um, the Paths Equity team, particularly uh, the names listed here, uh, because I've um, stolen slides from them. <laughs> and uh, also our funders, uh, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and Heart and Stroke Foundation, who fund funded Paths Equity for uh, Children, uh, but also um, all of our research, uh, uh, it, some of the funding comes from the government of Manitoba. Um, so now I'll, I'll stop talking and, and take any questions uh, that you have. All right. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic presentation. And if nothing else, it's certainly the best use of cartoons that I've ever seen in a presentation. <laughs> fantastic cartoons. Um, so that's my chance to uh, remind the audience to, uh, to type in any questions that you may have. We don't have any in right now, but we'll give everyone a chance to uh, type in some questions and uh, and we'll, we'll make sure we try our best to get them answered for you. Uh, but while we're waiting for people to type some in, I was just I'm just curious. I mean, one of the reasons that people might be uh, <laughs> haven't had any questions yet is you, you made it sound so easy when you were <laughs> describing how all of those different databases and the d different ministries and cross sectors and everything else. You made it sound so easy. C can you speak at all to uh, 
you know, how that happened. I think that's one of the things that many provinces or other, or certainly at the national level, the, the challenges of going across jurisdictions, across provinces, across ministries, and getting everyone to cooperate on a on contributing data to a common set or or identifying a common, uh, you know, the, the the pin number that everyone shares and that sort of thing. So, can, can you comment at all as to how that that sort of came about? Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, of course, I wasn't uh, around for, for a lot of it because, as I said, this started 40 years ago in Manitoba. And I think, um, you know, th- there's there's a bunch of elements that have, have made the stars align in Manitoba. One thing is the, the size of the province. Um, we're just over 1 million. Um, and so, you know, not only does that make record linkage uh, much easier, but really, um, for anyone who's from Manitoba, we always talk about there's one degree of separation. Everybody knows uh, someone who knows somebody else. And that really helps for this kind of work. Because as I said, the relationship building is so very key. Um, You know, some of my colleagues who are on the line who have done this in other provinces or are trying to do this in other provinces know sometimes it comes down to a personality. Um, You know, somebody is, is... putting up a roadblock. Um, And so as I mentioned, we have spent a lot of time and we continue to spend a lot of time. I mean, it's part of um, uh, what each of us as researchers do. We think, oh, hey, we just want to do research. We have to spend a lot of time talking with policymakers, um, uh, uh, working with policymakers, building and maintaining those uh, relationships. So um, it, it, it does take a lot of work. Um, And once it's done, you can't just sit back and say, oh, okay, you know, we've got it. You have to continue to maintain those relationships. The other thing um, that's kind of interesting, you know, having been involved in the center almost from its inception uh, 20 years ago, as I say, I don't go back the 40 years, but I do go back over 20 years. um, And, you know, we we made certain... um, uh, some of you on the line may have known Evelyn Shapiro, um, really sharp uh, in in all areas uh, concerned with policy. And um, we made certain that we didn't just deal with who was ever in power in government when we were talking to, to policymakers, um, but, uh, you know, talking to anybody and everybody uh, in government who, who would be interested in listening to us and also in the opposition. So, um, you know, it, it takes a lot of work. Um, it takes a lot of energy, but uh, the payoff is huge, as you can see. Uh, certainly, you demonstrated it is huge in this case, for sure. Uh, so we have had a few questions come in. And uh, if uh, if any of these questions, some people are, are typing and they're trying to sort of uh, save time by using short forms and stuff. So if anything doesn't make sense, we can always ask for a follow up. Uh, but Cecilia's asked, did you consider uh, time or duration as a covariate? Yes. Um, uh, you know, the short answer to that is yes. Uh, it depends on the study, uh, but um, for sure we've used uh, time and duration. Uh, for example, um, I'm just thinking about the um, uh, family first. Uh, we're able to look at, you know, how long a family was involved in the family first home visiting. So we know some families will start in home visiting and only have one or two visits. Some will be there for the full three years. So uh, for sure, we're able to look at uh, uh, time and duration depending on the on the study. Hopefully, I've answered that question. If you didn't answer the question, for any of the people asking questions, please, please do feel free to post a follow-up comment or, or a follow-up question, and we'll be sure to get back to that. Uh, the next question uh, came in from Karen, and she says, uh, if you were starting a data repository from scratch, what, mm. would you, what, yeah, what would be your approach related to determining priorities for data sourcing? For example, would you focus on low-hanging fruit in terms of ease of availability, or would you focus on a specific policy or question and source data related just to that, or would you have some other approach? Um, yeah, that's a that's a really great great question, and I think um, the low-hanging fruit is a great way to go, particularly because uh, sometimes you need to demonstrate uh, to whoever's providing the data, hey, this works and this can be of benefit. Um, and so if you can 
uh, you can get that low hanging fruit first off and and start showing yes um, you know this this actually can work um, this can show you things that you can't see from a single data set alone um, I think that's a, a a really great place to start um, and you know obviously you have to work with what you can work with uh, um, so it, it just for an example it, it took us many many years even though we were established in the health area uh, to get any of the social databases, the education data, um, uh, the family services data, many, many years of negotiation, even once all the players had agreed. Um, and so, yeah, you, you want to start with something uh, um, that's probably your simplest to begin with. Next question is from Keiko, and she says she finally found the question box. I don't, I don't think I did say where it was at the beginning. I usually do, but uh, it is. you should have a, a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and it's usually at the bottom of that control panel. You just type in and, and hit send, and the question should come through. But uh, Keiko's question is, uh, uh, she says, first of all, she says it's a fascinating presentation and great projects. She would like to know uh, now. Uh, she would like to know if they're connected to community data sets as well, like the community data program. Um, could she be more specific what the community data program is? So Keiko, could you give us a follow-up? I'm not sure if that might be a, uh, I know Keiko's in Montreal uh, predominantly, so uh, I'm not sure if that's a Quebec-based okay. thing or, <laughs> but Keiko, okay, if you so could just give us, you know, just in it. Sorry, go ahead. You know, I was just going to say in the meantime, I mean, we are connected to many community uh, interventions through Healthy Child Manitoba. So they run a lot of the interventions. Um, and some of those are, are um, uh, you know, collecting data at the community level. But it sounds like she's thinking of a specific project program. Uh, she says it's not Quebec-based. It's a program that links several small community programs data sets from community health centers. Oh, um, I'm not familiar with that, but, um, you know, there's no reason why it couldn't be linked through the through the process that I, I talked about right at the very beginning, as long as, um, uh, you know, all, all, all parties were in agreement and, um, you know, went through the proper anonymization. Um, uh, to my knowledge, we're not linked to uh, community health centers at this point, uh, but we are, of course, you know, we have linkages to physician visits, um, and some of those obviously would be at community health uh, centers, so um, uh, definitely it's, it's possible. All right. Well, she said, Keiko says she'd love to follow up with you if that's possible. For sure. Well, by all means, lad. <laughs> shoot me an email. My own email isn't up there, but if you go to our uh, MCHP website, you can find my email. Okay, and maybe we'll get that up on the screen at some point so everyone will yeah, have it for you. For sure. Uh, so Cecilia has posted a question. She says, uh, could you talk a little bit more about your metadata, for example, software, structure, things like that? Uh <laughs> Uh, thanks for the question, Cecilia. Uh, what I would do is I would direct you to our website because there's a lot of information. I think um, I'm seeing it up on my screen. Whoops. Um, but if you go over to um, the, the right side and there's something that says data repository, there's a whole lot of information about the metadata. Um, the software, um, I myself don't know about it, but there, there are many people at MCHP that do. So um, if Cecilia had a specific question that she wanted answered, you could send it to me and I would send it to, to Mark Smith, who is our associate director of the, the data repository, and he would have those answers for you. Yep. Oh, and I see there's the, the page on the, the website. So lots of uh, information, um, and each of those links uh, has even more information. So um, uh, lots to explore on the website. And as I say, if there's there's more information needed, uh, there's probably a contact us uh, part. Uh, and as I say, contact me, give me your question, and I'll send it to the, the person most knowledgeable, which in this case is not me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next question is from John, and he's asking, could you comment on analysis of some of some of the SEL programs Manitoba is testing. For example, the other paths programs, uh, pathways to alternative thinking strategies, and the PAX GBG program. And hopefully, you know what some of those mean. But. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so John, I'm thinking by SEL you mean social and emotional learning, um, and by PAX, uh, what PAX is? I'm not sure if PX. PAX stands for anything, but I think what John's referring to is something called the Good Behavior Game, 
which comes out of the Paxis Institute in, in um, the States. Um, many, many of you may be familiar with Dennis Embry, um, who, who um, is head of that Paxis Institute. So um, let me ask, answer the, the Pax Good Behavior Game first. The Pax Good Behavior Game is a, a, a program, an intervention. It's running in Manitoba. It's running in other provinces. Um, in Manitoba, they're, they're focusing on grade one students. And it's a, a program. It, it, it's fairly simple, but um, teachers are trained in this program. And it's really rewarding positive behaviors. And there's a, quite a bit of research uh, in the states coming out of this and long-term research that shows absolutely wonderful benefits, you know, reductions in attention deficit disorder, uh, reductions in, you know, outbursts in the classroom and in emotional behavior disorders, reductions in long-term mental, dis like, reductions long-term in mental disorders, um, so some really positive benefits. Uh, PAC started operating in Manitoba and um, I'm going to guess at this, but I think it was 2011, uh, there was a pilot done, and then 2012, um, uh, 200 schools were involved. So it was a really a little late to get into part of our PATHS program of research, but we have recently been asked, uh, something I didn't go into detail, but um, um, at MCHP, uh, we get almost half of our funding from the government of Manitoba, and in return for that funding, we do five major projects a year for the government. Um, and one of those projects every year is um, decided upon by the Healthy Child Committee of Cabinet. So every year for the last several years, we've been able to focus one of those projects on, on kids' development. And, and so Healthy Child Committee of Cabinet basically comes up with a, uh, you know, sort of a sort of broad question, and then uh, MCHP puts the specifics on it. Um, and one of the recent projects we've been asked to evaluate is the PACS. So it will be a future evaluation, not part of the, uh, the PAVS program of research. PAVS and PACS, it gets kind of confusing. Um, in terms of social and emotional learning, um, we do have measures of that, um, but fewer measures in, in um, uh, our repository, just because the Department of Education, where we get many of our measures, uh, focuses more on academic, um, you know, not surprisingly than those social emotional measures. Uh, but there is the, the student engagement in grade seven. Um, the EDI measures social and emotional uh, development. And also, you know, through using some of the health data sets, connecting some of the health data sets, we can um, look at sort of the flip side of positive uh, social and emotional development, look at kids with mental disorders. So um, many of those things we are looking at um, as outcomes in, in some of our past projects. So hopefully I've answered John question. <laughs> that you did get all of the uh, acronyms correct. He said you checked <laughs> on all of them. Uh, he, he also comment, commented that PATHS, he just, he just commented excellent. He thought your answer was excellent. Uh, but he said PATHS is being assessed in collaboration with this more acronyms here, the SEEK project in Nova Scotia, S-E-A-K, which sounds like it must be a similar program in Nova Scotia. Yes, and that's a different PATHS than our PATHS. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the next question came in from uh, Lynn. Uh, and before I get onto that, John also asked, is it possible to have a uh, copy of your PDF presentation? Which we um, Yeah, I, I, I think so. I'll, I'll have to clear that through Manitoba Health just because, or the Health Information Privacy Committee, just because um, the stuff I presented on the Families First and the Healthy Baby hasn't been uh, published yet, but uh, once that's cleared, I, I see no problem in that because you know we have presented on at conferences on these things. Okay, and and what we typically do is if we're able to get the presentation from the presenters, we just put it on the Knowledge Exchange Network on the same page as the recording of this session will go. Yep. And uh, and if you need to send an altered version, if there needs to be something redacted from it uh, because it's unpublished data or something like that, feel free, and uh, and we'll get that posted on the page that you can see on the screen there. Okay. Uh, and uh, the next, the last question that we have here, so let's uh, just last, sort of, we'll sort of put out a last call. Anyone who has another question following this, please uh, feel free to uh, type those in, and we'll try and get to those. But this is the last question we have for now, and it's from Lynn, and she's asking: In the Healthy Baby program, what did you find out about the impact of community-based services on reducing inequity? 
Um, Lynn, I'm going to have to ask you to stay tuned because um, that's we're just in the process of evaluating that now. Uh, we did do a report uh, a number of years ago that's available on our website, and and um, that we didn't have the same sophisticated methodology that uh, we've used for the PAS or that we're using for the PAS. Um, so our evaluation of the community support programs is right now happening. I don't have any uh, preliminary analysis on that, but if you wanted to look up or if you you wanted to contact me and I could send you the, the report that came out uh, a few years ago. Uh, we did find that community-based support programs, when uh, combined with the prenatal benefit, uh, were associated with increased breastfeeding. Uh, let me just try and remember, also associated with receipt of adequate prenatal care. Um, I think those were the, the two uh, positive benefits of the community uh, support programs. All right, and that, uh, oh, we had one last question just came in. Uh, John, again, just wondering uh, how you link or embed RCTs in your data sets. For example, about three years ago, there was an RCT of, of ROE, RCT, I know yep. that means, I'm not sure ROE, but uh, done by uh, R. Santos and uh, yep. others that must have used large data, database information. Uh, it seems like a great opportunity to combine trial data and your data. Yep, fantastic question, John. It's almost like you're a plant. Um, for those of you, I, I, I think everybody knows RCT is randomized controlled trial, uh, but you may not know ROE is roots of empathy. And yes, Rob Santos, uh, and his colleagues from Healthy Child Manitoba did a uh, randomized controlled trial of Roots of Empathy. Um, and I, I'm not involved in that particular analysis, but that is part of PATH because we're able to incorporate, we know who was in uh, which uh, uh, group, uh, and uh, we're able now to look at long-term follow-up without actually, you know, using our repository without actually going back and, and you know, re-questioning uh, the kids or, or doing evaluations on the kids. So uh, the repository is an absolutely fabulous, uh, you know, everybody holds up RCTs as, as the absolute gold standard and if you can do them, great. But even when you have RCTs, sometimes it's hard to do that long-term follow-up. So if you can have the, the information that's necessary to, to link uh, the data gathered from an RCT into a repository like MCHP repository, it provides uh, you know, a great resource to do long-term follow-up and that's exactly what we're doing. So um, yep, John, we are, we're, we're on it and Rob's involved in that, so thanks. All right. Well, that's the end of the questions. Uh, and uh, as you said, stay tuned for uh, for Delin uh, for some of the outcomes of some of the the, the projects that you're working on. I, I certainly hope that you would uh, consider coming back to a presentation as some of these uh, projects are completed with uh, with the results and analysis. Because I think there's, as we can see, there's huge interest in this uh, sort of information. For sure. All right. Well, I think we're going to close it off there. Is there any closing comments, any final, anything final, any to, final to close it off that you'd like to say? Um, other than, you know, I meant to put the PATH website up. I see I just have the MCHP website. But, you know, if you go to the MCHP website, you can, there's, there should be a link to the PATH website. Um, as well, um, my email address is just my name, my first name, underscore my last name, and then at cpe.umanitoba.ca and um, you know I welcome questions by email I know I can't answer all of them but I, I'm pretty sure I know who can, who can answer each of the questions so uh, feel free to, to email me all right. Well, there thank we you. There's yeah. So we, yeah, we've got the email address up on the screen there, Marnie underscore Brownell at cpe.umanitoba.ca. All right. Well, with that, we'll close it off. So again, huge thanks for the fantastic presentation, and uh, I'm sure we will get lots of uh, views uh, following this. So as just a reminder to the audience, this was recorded. Please, uh, please do share it with whoever of your colleagues was not able to join us or that you think have missed a great presentation. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get lots of feedback for sure, and I'm happy to pass that along to. Uh, Dr. Brownell. So thanks again for a great presentation. Well, thanks for the opportunity and all the great feedback. Thanks. Right. And thank you to the audience for joining us. We do typically do these uh, webinars at 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time on uh, Wednesdays. 
Uh, and uh, we do have a pretty – we have something next week. Uh, I don't have it up in front of me right now. I do. I know we do have a presentation next week, uh, an urgent consult uh, program for mental health uh, – children with mental health uh, disorders coming into emergency rooms, uh, coming to us from our colleagues at the Kingston General Hospital and the Hotel Dew in Kingston, Ontario. So stay tuned for that uh, presentation next week. And then following that, we have a presentation from our uh, committee, uh, our, our working group at CAFC, our interfacility transport working group, uh, to bring us some information about uh, Ebola in the interfacility uh, transport environment. So uh, certainly a timely topic there with all of the concerns around Ebola. Uh, and then follow, and then I think that will wrap it up uh, f- while we uh, close up for our Christmas break uh, for the f- couple weeks over Christmas, and then we'll be back with a full schedule in January. So lots more information to be posted on the website uh, soon about all of the presentations that we have filling January and February. So hopefully we'll see you guys, everyone next, w- uh, next week. And uh, thanks again for coming, and we'll see you soon. Bye, everyone.